Hello, ladies and gentlemen, it's Mike here at Game From Scratch, and welcome to Default for Unity Developers. This is the second part in a series where I showcase other game engines through the eyes of Unity Developers, which, for some whatever reason, may be looking for another game engine. Now, I already did one of these with the, the, uh, the Godot game engine, and this one is going to be a little bit different, because Godot is a bit more of a one-to-one -one mapping with the way that things work in Unity. Default, <laughs> Default is its own beast. Default beats to its own drum. In fact, it invented its own instrument, and it beats to the sound of that one. And I actually think this is brilliant, to be honest. So Default Default is available at Default.com. Uh, there's a lot of things to really like about it. It is cross-platform. There's actually PlayStation 5 and Xbox uh, series or whatever the hell they're called now. Uh, support coming later on this year or early next year. But you've got your major platforms all available here. It is just quite cool. And it's also, it's free, comma, forever forever. They're not changing that, which is also kind of nice. Uh, it is uh, a project that was originally started by King. Uh, they spun it off as an open source project. This was created to do their own mobile and in-house game. So if you're looking for a mobile or web game authoring solution, this could be one of the very best ones. So let's jump in hands-on with this guy. And first off, I'm going to start with the install process. So the first thing you're going to have to do is pick which plan or tier or subscription you'd like. No, you don't. You click download. That's it. That's, it's a very hard task. You go to download, and then you got to make the biggest decision of your life. Which platform are you running? In my case, I'm doing Windows, so I will click Windows, and this will download the zip file. Now, I've already downloaded the zip file, not that we're going to save a ton of time, because this engine is 335 megabytes in size. So, again, another Svelte entry here, and your install process is quite literally zip extract. Now, on Mac, it is a much more difficult process. What you have to do is take default.app, and you drag that into your applications folder. I know, much harder install. Now, once that is done, you got your installation out of the way. There is no launcher, no nothing. Literally, just click default.exe and it brings it up. You're going to find, and the way I would describe default in a single world is elegant. Everything is just thought out, clean, and smooth. I do really appreciate that. And if I just scared you with the way I said smooth, I apologize for that as well. So we're going to start off, we're just going to show you from a sample project here so you get an idea of, you know, what the workflow is like. I'm not going to go into a ton of detail. From one, I've actually done two full tutorial series on using the folds. So if you want to learn more, you can. Obviously, you can open your project this way, but what we're going to do is create a new project. You've got a number of different options as starting templates here. So you can set it up to be like a mobile game, a monetized web game, uh, various different distributions, basic 3D. By the way, there is full 3D support here. It's just, it's pretty small in my opinion, and I wouldn't recommend this engine for it. Or if you're creating a platformer, you can build it from a platformer. But what I'm going to do today instead is load this from a tutorial. There's also some samples you can download from as well. And on the topic of samples, I want you to know, there's also here this asset portal. So if you're coming from Unity and you're afraid about losing support for a specific service you use or something, do be sure to come over here, check out the asset portal. And what you might find is, say, say you're using uh, Nakama, for example, for your server, it's available here. If you're using uh, Google Ads, it's available here. Or if you're using Steamworks, it's available here. So you're going to find there are a ton of uh, really cool extensions already created for this. So the ecosystem is pretty well established. So I'm going to do this again using this particular example here. And I'm going to try to map this to the Unity experience as much as possible, but let's be honest, it's a losing cause because this is a very different approach to game development. Let me just go get this guy out of full screen so that it doesn't show up weird in the, the background like that. All right, here we go. So this is the fold. It is a very, oh, what's the word I used again? Elegant. Set up. I, I very much like their editor approach. Uh, over here, if you're wondering, okay, what is a scene in it? And scene is basically just a collection. So here, main, uh, again, main is a pretty standard entry point into a game. This is by convention, by the way, you can break this if you so wish. Uh, and then you can find here inside of main, you've got main collection. Now, this is more or less what you would consider a level in Unity. A collection is a collection of stuff. Now, what those stuff means that make up your game, I will explain because this is kind of the heart of how uh, the whole process works. The editor, very smooth. Uh, one thing I will say about the fold, I've actually been using the fold since it was very first release, like in the entire time that it's been out for several years now. Um, I have never experienced an editor crash, ever. I can't say that about Unity for sure. I can't even say that about the Godot game engine. But for this guy, yeah. Yeah, I definitely, I've never experienced a crash, which means that I'm going to somehow do that during this video because that's the way that Karma works. Now, this is, again, the scene or the, the dot collection is basically where you could compose your scene. Everything is more or less made out of game objects. So here you see I've got a background game object. This background game object is literally just a container for this sprite object, which is this guy right here which again, you got normal manipulators for handling it. By the way, you do have full undo and all that stuff. But this game object, I'll show you this guy because it's about as simple as they get. It is a container. Uh, so it's like a game object in, um, 
unity, but stripped down to nothingness. So what you see here, there's an ID, there's a URL, which is very important to uh, the way that the defo um, default works and that everything is uh, got uh, this addressing system built into it because you could do a synchronous message passing. I'll get to that in just a minute. Uh, and then you've got your position data. So that is all that is really in a game object to start with. Uh, and then here you can see a component inside of a game object. So to add a component to a game object, literally just right click, add component. And you can see you've got a variety of different things here. So you got things like 3D models or meshes, which is kind of cool. So you do have your full 3D support available here. Layer uh, um, labels. So if you want to have just simple text in there, there is support for GUIs as well. I'll get to that in just a second here. Uh, then we've got a sound object you could put in or a sprite in here as well. So that's sort of how you compose your entities. Now, the other thing you may have noticed here is you can also add game object file. Now, a game object file is about as close as you're going to get to a prefab. So let's showcase that next. So you see this guy right here, this is Spaceship. It's basically a player, and you can see if I expand down the hierarchy of it, it's got a script and a sprite attached to it. So what I'm going to do is this is instantiated as a game object. So if I came up here, if I wanted to add another one, you can do it. So instead of adding it as a game object, I'd add it as a game object file like this. And this is me instantiating the spaceship.gameobject file from disk as a game object in system. So there we got now another one right there. So that is more or less, oops. Ooh, that was a far too encompassing delete. Uh, that is the prefab system. So let's go ahead and open that guy up. So we're gonna switch here into the spaceships folder right here. And then notice we've got spaceship game object. This is very zoomed in. This is built up of a script and a sprite. The sprite is made out of, and by the way, you can expand all this stuff. The image is built out of an atlas. It has an animation of type spin, like so. By the way, you can hit space to see this, the animation in action, like so. So you can, you can actually preview the animation directly in the editor if you wish. And then this is built out of an atlas. The atlas is over here and the atlas is your traditional texture packing all together to create animations. Then you can pick and put all the frames together to create this. So this is the spin animation. If I want to create from this atlas a different set of animations that come up here, and you're gonna notice this consistently here. So when I'm working with something different and I do an add, before it was add component. Now what you're seeing is add animation group. All these tools are sort of just hidden away inside of the editor until you need it. Again, the word I use is elegant. The thing that you can see across the top here, you do have this tab-based uh, setup for handling things. And next thing you can notice, there is a script to control this game object. So let's go and open that one up. And this is going to be where I lose some of you for sure, because the main scripting language for the default game engine is Lua. Uh, I like Lua. I think Lua is a great choice for game engines. For a while there, it was like the powering technology of every mobile game engine being made that wasn't Unity. Uh, but it's kind of faded a little bit in uh, popularity as of late, but I still, I think it's a great choice for game script logic. Here you can see it in action. By the way, you can also extend this. Uh, so if you want to do some of the stuff using more native code and then extend out, you can write your own extensions. So this is for client side programming. Another aspect, and I don't recommend it immediately, but you'll notice if we go back to the asset portal, there is a hacks language extension. So first off, this will tell you the extent and capabilities of the extension system. Yes, you can add language support for other languages to default. Someone actually managed to do it with the hacks language as an example. All right, so here we can see how a script works. And there's a couple of really key things to be aware of with this. Now, first one, from a Unity background, it's gonna look kind of familiar because you've got the same life cycle callbacks. You know, if you've got uh, your init for your initialization when it's first added in, uh, then you've got your update, it's gonna be called every frame. It, it uses a pretty traditional approach there. So you can see function init, this code is a callback that's basically gonna be called when this um, game object is initialized into the scene, this is called. Here, update, this is called every pass through your game loop. On input, when an input event occurs, this is called. So uh, it, it's a very similar callback. It's kind of a universal game engine approach these days. So you're gonna find those same basic callback overrides are implemented in just about every game engine at this point in time. Now, what you may not notice is stuff like this one. So this is message passing. This is a very, very important part of the fold. It's gonna take a little bit to get used to, but once you get used to it, it is very powerful in that it allows you to have asynchronous communication with zero coupling. So if I wanna send a, a message out to a specific um, game object or just broadly, you can do so. Same way I can listen to, so for example, this guy's listening to input messaging here. Uh, but this guy is sending out a message, so posting a message uh, to itself, which again, you, you, you gotta get into the documentation to figure out exactly how this works, to say, okay, I want to acquire input focus. So basically saying put, you know, 
if there are input events, handle it to this particular game object. And then uh, you also have, like, there's render. You can send messages to the rendering subsystem to say clear the background. So it uses a messaging system across, and then same here, your game objects. Everything has a full set of uh, commands attached to it. So here, we're calling the, the animate on the Euler Z coordinate here. And by the way, you can animate just about any comp uh, component in the game, same with like a GUI element or um, a scale or color or whatever. And then you do have full tweening libraries for handling that kind of stuff too. So you can do just about any kind of um, GUI special effect you wish with animations, etc. And you can do it all with code if you so wish. By the way, speaking of code, when you are in the editor, you'll find you do get full uh, code completion and suggestions, IntelliSense, etc., which in my world now is a mandatory thing. The other thing that you will find is a, you can actually set uh, breakpoints like so, uh, and you have a full debugger. Speaking of debugger, let us go back to the main collection here or your scene. Uh, go to debug and start. So one, two, three, three seconds about three seconds to run a particular game in this case. So that's your, your typical project startup sign. Uh, I would say probably faster than Unity, probably slower than Godot, but it, it's never super slow. And so it's, it's not um, a really painful process to create your games in that regard. Now, I wanna actually show you how hidden away certain things are. So let's go back here to our collection. So our main collection right here, you're gonna notice uh, when it first loads up, we implement the main object. The main object contains a GUI object and a script. So let's go to this GUI object for this main. So this guy is being loaded up. Now this is a very simple GUI, and over here it is a .GUI file. But once we've loaded up a .GUI, you'll notice over here our, um, our outline, we've got completely different functionality again. So now what we've got, for example, this guy is very simple. It's a, it's a text node UI. So this would be where you, where you put a high score or whatever. But this is where you could do all your UI, uh, UI composition. You're going to notice for this text guy, you got a ton of controls over. You've got shadowing. Uh, you've got um, alpha for that. You've got different blending modes. You've got anchoring and pivoting support here as well. Obviously, you've got control over the, the text that appears, including rich text support there. Uh, and I can add various different nodes in. So if I want to do, I could have um, a particle system in here, a GUI element in here as well. We can bring in various different materials. You've got full font support. So you see here, this is loading score.font. Let's go up here, look at the font itself. So it is based off a TTF file, but it creates this entity for handling the font. So you get a nice font preview of your font file. And then again here, you have control over all of those things. So if you wanted to change the size of your font, you can do it right here, the anti-alias, so let's say, all right, so we want to have bigger font right there. Uh, we want to have it not anti-aliased or anti-aliased. You got full control, all these various different um, attributes of your font generation, and you get this nice preview of it there. Everything has all of these various different tools there, but you don't see them until you're actually, so you don't even see that until you're actually in a font file or whatever particular editor you happen to be working on at that time. So you need to set up a layout for, um, portrait or landscape, the menu, the ads change dynamically based on whatever you're working with. But next one here you notice is, okay, well I could create a particle system. I could do a new particle effect. How would I add a particle system? Well, let's go over here uh, and then I, I could do like a new folder here. So let's do um, new folder and it's like my stuff, right? So, so inside of my folder, what I just do is go new and we open up a whole new world of possibility over here. So what you're going to notice here is you've got a ton of different things here. So if you want to create like a texture atlas over here, you do that, and then boom, this will bring up the tet tet uh, tet the atlas editor at that point in time. Or if I want to go ahead and create a 3D model or a mesh, I can bring it in that way. Or like I said, if I want to create a particle system, I just go boom, create a new particle system, and I can say my party. Like so create it like this, and then boom, here is the particle system editor. And we start off, so again, it just completely changes the tools that are available to you. So you can notice over here, this has various different options. So I could add an, ed, uh, an emitter. You get an emitter by default, so you got multiple different emitters here, but you would have no idea, like, because you're used to an engine where all of the stuff is basically like add new, and then like 2D, component, and then this, then that, and then drop. This one, it's kind of the 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 thing is hidden in the area where it is used, if that makes sense in the end. So the tooling for particle systems are only in the particle system here. So if I wanted to have a modifier on this particle, I could do so. So here's the emitter right there. I do believe once again, it is space to preview it in action like so. And then if I wanted to go ahead and say, I wanna add a modifier to this guy, you notice the menu changed again. And then I have my options there. So I could do vortex and there's the vortex in the scene, which by the way, I could then 
and move around. So you do have this full particle system in here, and then it, it was just hidden away until you actually needed it. Well, you're gonna find that just generally, I think that that is the theme behind the default engine. It's got the tool you want. It's just only there when you need it. And it's gonna take, when you're first learning it, you're like, how the hell do I? But once you're there and you start getting it clicks, you're gonna find, okay, this, this makes sense. And I do like this. And it, it's, again, it is a completely different workflow than what you are used to. Uh, but it is also a very, very polished one. The, the editor that is built in here, very polished. By the way, there's also Visual Studio Code tools, so you don't want to work internally in their editor. You can do so. You also got things here like a curve editor for handling uh, anything over time. Any pr any uh, property can be animated. It can be animated on a curve. There's a curve editor for handling those things. It is a it's a special engine. It's an engine, again, that does things in its own way. And that's one of those things that you definitely want to be available or aware of. Now, uh, in closing, there are a couple of fine details I should probably cover. Uh, again, the source code is available. It's not under an OSI license. You can modify it. You can change it. You can build it for your own project. You just can't really commercially sell it as a game engine. I think that was the primary changes they made. Another thing you want to be aware of is with platforms. So very cool. We do have PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series support coming later this year or early next year. But if you're dealing with this guy, this guy, and the Nintendo Switch or the PlayStation 4, just because there is a proprietary nature involved there and external tools required. You don't need to send it off to a porting house or anything like that, but there is additional tooling you need, and that is paywalled. But it's very cheaply paywalled, it's something like 250 bucks or something like that. But if you do want to publish for platforms, there is definitely an initial cost. So that is the, I would say that the fold is completely free, but it is almost completely free with uh, basically the, the major platforms like a uh, third-party lockdown platforms having a price tag of all. A very a cheap price tag, especially when you're talking about publishing to consoles. Because if you're at that point in time, there's a pretty good chance that you have uh, you know, funding and money and you're good to go and a couple hundred dollars is not gonna kill you. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, that is Defold. Uh, again, the project is also available up on GitHub. Uh, it is uh, a highly recommended engine, to be honest. I, I, I like Default, I like what they've done with another cool thing about Default that I didn't really cover on. So here are some, of course, of the titles that have been shipped with Default. It is, again, a battle-tested engine with shipped titles out there. Um, it also creates very small games out of the box in that uh, for like web games, for example, it's like one megabyte as the smallest size executable. Uh, Android is like two or three megabytes, like, like, and iOS is like one and a half megabytes. It's, it's insane how small a games Default makes. So if you're in those markets, again, that is number one area where I recommend people uh, check out the folders. If you're currently using Unity Game Engine for mobile or web games, two or two and a half D, the Fold is a very mature project, a very polished project with a very good ecosystem, good documentation, very cool tooling and functionality. Again, when you first load up the Fold, you're gonna say, okay, where is this? What, how do I do a UI? How do I do this? How do I do a particle system? How do I do, it's all there, it's just, only where it needs to be. And I think that that is sort of like the strength and in some ways a weakness of the fold. Uh, it does have, by the way, a full physics simulation uh, in there as well. It is a very, very cool engine. As I mentioned here, here are some of the sizes that it actually generates compared to other engines. Uh, it also um, creates very fast games and it should run well on old hardware. If you're in the mobile market, especially because it does have all of the um, the stuff that you need, Firebase, Google Play, uh, Google and Apple push notification APIs, uh, various different back ends for game systems and more in the asset portals. And you've got even AdMob, Iron Source, if for some reason you wanna stay in that uh, realm. Uh, you have all of these APIs already ready to go. So if you are a mobile game maker looking for a soft landing away from the Unity game engine, the fold is easily my best recommendation there. Now again, that's not to say that, uh, for example, Godot, and Godot is a great choice for 2D games for sure. For mobile games, a little bit less tested. Uh, and I, I'm, you know what, it, it, it's default is not going to be for everyone. It has a very different approach to the way it developed games. It's either going to speak to you or swear to you. And uh, I, I, I I love it for that. It's such a unique beast. And again, I have done a couple tutorials. I will link those down below if you want to learn a little bit more about the Fold. But hopefully this quick introduction gave you an idea of what to expect from this charming little engine. That's it. I will talk to you all later. Goodbye.